All right, hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to the Wiseman Art Museum. I'm Laura Polarski, Student Engagement and Learning Specialist here at the museum. Uh, tonight we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and the Wiseman Art Museum is located within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It's important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with the tribal nations. Uh, this land acknowledgement is just a first step in the long and complex process of reconciling with the colonial legacy of our institution. And with this acknowledgement and our ongoing work with the repatriation of the Membrace Cultural Materials and the Truth and Repair uh, Project, we affirm our commitment to this process. We would also like to thank the KR KHR Family Fund for general operating support for the Wiseman's exhibitions and programs and to the Givens Foundation for African American Literature for their generous support of this program. I'm so pleased to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Dr. Megan Finch. Uh, Dr. Megan Finch is an assistant professor in the English department here at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, uh, where she teaches courses on American literature. Her work focuses on representations of madness within the late 20th century black women's novels. Uh, Dr. Finch's writing has or will appear in South American Literary History Online, Cultural Critique, Differences, and M-E-L-U-S, or Mellis. And she was also on the curating team for the current exhibition, Dark Testament, A Century of Black Writers on Justice at the American Writers Museum in Chicago. So we welcome her to the stage now. I hope that talk is something of an overstatement, um, as I really hope this is a conversation, um, although I will talk a little bit in the end. Um, and in the kind of spirit of it being somewhat of a talk, I guess it would be titled, James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket, A Life, A Legacy, A Profit. There are days, this is one of them, when you wonder what your role in this country and what your future is in it. Baldwin begins the documentary with that, and so too do I. In 1986, just over a year and a half after, before his death, James Baldwin and Karen Thorson, the director, of the documentary met to discuss a potential film project. As Thorson narrates the story in her 2020 essay, The Disorder of Life, James Baldwin, On My Shoulder, the meeting came about during her time working for the Maisel's Brothers, well known for their direct cinema or cinema verite documentary filmmaking, a style that attempted to minimize the mediation of its subjects by utilizing handheld cameras and on-location sound without voiceover narration in an attempt to, quote, place the viewers in a position of vicarious witness, end quote. Someone, Thorson writes, sent a letter to our penthouse office suggesting a number of famous people as ideal subjects for a direct cinema portrait, and James Baldwin was on that list. The pair met only once, a meeting during which Baldwin proposed, quote, a cinema verite film about the writing of his next book, Remember This House, a project that would revisit the civil rights movement and the assassination of Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King Jr. to consider how far we, as a nation, had or had not come. Baldwin planned to return to the adult children of these murdered men, whom he had met as children decades before, and ask them, and ask them on camera, quote, was it worth it that your father was assassinated? There was only the one meeting because, on December 1st, according to the official re records, and November 31st, according to his brother, James Baldwin, 63, died in his home in France. Then, as Thorson writes, quote, a cinema verite film was no longer possible. But the need for a film about Baldwin suddenly took on new importance. James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket, is that film. And the first footage shot for it is of Baldwin's memorial, attended by thousands at the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine. The cinema verite was no longer possible. The tension between cost and value that animates the question, was it worth it that your father was assassinated, structures, even at the level of its subtitle, James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket. In the essay, The Price of the Ticket, 
published as the introduction to the 1985 collected volume of the same name, Baldwin describes two tickets, a black ticket whose price is fatally bound up in the dream of becoming white, and a white ticket, the price of which is the delusion that some actually are. The price and the value of these tickets pale in comparison to the one Baldwin names in the final lines from the film, quote, I really do believe that we can all become better than we are. I know we can, but the price is enormous and people are not yet willing to pay it. Baldwin, born in 1925, was older then and outlived by almost two decades, Evers, 1925 to 1963, Malcolm X, 1925 to 1965, and King, 1929 to 1968. The witness that Baldwin bore to this nation's, his nation's, apoplectic response to the fact that the black man who, to quote from Baldwin's My Dungeon Shook, letter to my nephew, quote, had functioned in the white man's world as a fixed star, as an immovable pillar, was moving out of his place, extracted a price from him as well. In response to a question about the long time between novels, Baldwin explained, I must point out, though, too, that I have been working the last few years between assassinations, and that doesn't make it any, and that doesn't make it any easier either. End quote. In asking their children if the deaths had been worth it, he might have also been asking himself the same question. Remember this house, at least as it is described, is an accounting of what the ticket actually was and is for. Whether it was in black and white or the much more valuable and more costly one, human one. And whether it was, and perhaps whether it could ever be, worth, from the vantage point of the late 80s, even one of the many thousand gone. Thorson's documentary evokes this accounting in the irreconcilability of James Baldwin, the person, the story of a life and its meaning to and is told by those who loved him, and James Baldwin, the author and activist, the register of public person and deed, their meaning and legacy, at and mediated by the moment in which they are counted. And just as James Baldwin's The Price of the Ticket must negotiate the telling of a life that spanned from 1924 to 1987, and the witness and shaping of that legacy in 1989, we, here today, might, in addition to those things, consider how the film appears to us in the year in which James Baldwin would have celebrated his 100th birthday as witness to and profit of our future. To briefly sketch the context in which this film appeared in 1989, various decline narratives structured the cultural view of James Baldwin by the 80s and persist today. These narratives often predate and allied the labor of witnessing the murder of so many friends by suggesting that Baldwin was exhausted by the fire next time in 1962 and found his message out of step with the black power movements that emerged by the late 1960s. Tell me how long the train's been gone, if Beale Street could talk, and especially just above my head, are made proof of Baldwin's supposed waning grasp on the moment, as well as of the broader thesis that he was primarily an essayist anyways. At the same time, even the essays that emerged during that moment, evidence of things unseen, and no name in the streets, were and continue to be ambivalently regarded in the construction of Baldwin's legacy, often as indications of Baldwin's glowing bitterness. And hopefully you've all seen the film and kind of see the way that that plays out in, within the film. Thus, the Southern phase of the civil rights movement became both the site and source of Baldwin's most, most powerful articulations and was cast as the formative, or even traumatic moment that made subsequent articulations increasingly less incisive and more out and more out of touch. By the time the documentary filmed on PBS in 1989, Baldwin's reputation was and had been for some time that of civil rights era legend. Consuela Francis writes in The Critical Reception of James Baldwin 1963 to, 19, to 2010, there was a general agreement that he was an important African-American writer, 
though his relevance was primarily historical. That is, he wrote several seminal essays that were important at a particular point in time. Critics generally agreed that his career peaked in the 1960s and that while he excelled in the essay, with the exception of Go Tell It on the Mountain, he fell short in other genres. And finally, that Baldwin spoke most passionately about race, downplayed his sexual orientation, and denounced his Christianity. So my contention here and what I hope that we can kind of think through as we watch some clips from the film, as time really won't permit us to watch the entirety of it, is to think about how the film, how its construction, um, its juxtaposition of various voices, really intervenes in what I've described as the kind of particular moment of the 1980s of Baldwin's um, reception. And then to think about that kind of constantly through the lens of Baldwin's kind of really incalculable influence and kind of presence in, the, in our contemporary moment. So, I'm, so this ends me kind of just monologuing, so we're gonna take a look at the opening, and really I, I hope that we can all kind of think through, I have some things that I'm thinking about, but I really do hope that people will also kind of share how they encounter this moment, right? Because in some ways, and I think that this is the complexity of Baldwin, is that, while I don't consider myself an expert, we all kind of are in, in the wake of both Baldwin's life, work, and the kind of ways that we are that we consume um, his witness. So. There are days. This is one of them. When you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it. From my point of view, no label and no slogan and no party and no um, skin color and indeed no religion is more important than the human being. Now, when you were starting out as a writer, you were a black, impoverished, homosexual. You must have said to yourself, gee, how disadvantaged can I get? Oh, no, I thought I hit the jackpot. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> it was so outrageous, you could not go any further, you know. It had to be, it, so you had to find a way to use it. Sometimes I feel like I'm 
Jim when he and I and the world were young enough to believe ourselves independently salvageable. We became friends in the late 50s, just as the United States was poised to make its quantum leap into the future, just as Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and other Southerners were girding themselves for the second civil war in 100 years, and just when Malcolm X was giving voice to the anger in the streets and in the minds of northern black city folks. In that riotous pulse of political fervor, James Baldwin and I met again and liked each other. In this particular society, um, we are supposed to be so contained Men are supposed to be men. Women are supposed to be women and not need, really need anybody else. The ability to ask, will you be my brother? The courage to ask is often missing. James Baldwin was a brother. Incredible. He lived his life as witness. He wrote until the end. We hear of the writer's blocks of celebrated Americans, how great they are, so great indeed that their writing fingers have been turned to checks. But Jimmy wrote, he produced, he spoke, he sang, no matter the odds, he remained man and spirit and voice, ever expanding and ever more conscious. Let us hold him in our hearts and minds. Let us make him a part of our invincible black souls, the intelligence of our transcendence. Let our black hearts grow big, world-absorbing eyes like his, never closed. Let us one day be able to celebrate him like he must be celebrated if we are ever truly to be self-determining. For Jimmy was God's black revolutionary mouth, if there is a God, and revolution his righteous natural expression. So I wonder what people kind of think, if this is your first time encountering this or whether you've seen the entire documentary. We have at least kind of three, what seem like separate phases here, right? We have Baldwin speaking, we have the funeral, and then we have this moment where we kind of go back to 1924. Um, and I just wonder kind of how, maybe just immediate impressions that people might have. I said this was gonna be interactive, so I really, meant it. <laughs> ah, any immediate kind of reactions to that juxtaposition? Any kind of immediate thoughts as to how, why, what effect those choices might have? Thinking about, as I've kind of described, this 1989 moment where Baldwin is kind of seen as someone who was a powerful spokesperson for a bygone era. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about the like shot where it shows Justin Pierce and his wife, like from 1927, and how that is immediately fall, like preceded by like this discussion about containers and like you know the the man and the woman being like so separate and this kind of like the individual also being very separated and then be kept to this like container of his life, you know, by these years. So there's something going on there, I think, um, but also just like thinking about the individual and this being this like huge, you know, group of people who are also mourning him, you know, very collectively at the same time. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point also in kind of thinking about or juxtaposing Dr. Maya Angelou and Amiri Baraka and the kind of the way that both Andrew kind of speaks to the individual and you know and sometimes her work is sometimes kind of thought of in that regard and then the way that Baraka not only is kind of I think within this avatar of the black arts movement but also the kind of way he mobilizes um, the entire space right where we we kind of hear the engagement with clapping and and just in general his kind of public persona and you know, engagement. So I think, yeah, there's something kind of interesting there in thinking about that juxtaposition of the individual um, and the way she kind of thinks about it in terms of, will you be my brother? And the kind of way he mobilizes it slightly differently. Um, yeah, and then to think of this kind of 
and then here's a life, <laughs> and then takes us back to something that feels archaic, right? The depiction here feels very, um, almost, it reads to me as somewhat hokey, but I'm not quite sure that that was the intent or what might have kind of, um, particularly with the sound that's kind of happening there. It's like doo 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 doo. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like also with the, the imagery of this funeral um, and the way in which it feels like, um, like we're witnessing obviously the passing of like a great man, right? But then there's also this, these epitaphs of like witness and you mentioned the prophet and there, there are these sort of very heavy sort of labels attached to them. And I think the film is starting out by I think, teasing like these various iterations of his um, character or how he's characterized by us and how we all see him. And then um, I feel like moving to this space, it's it's almost like a um, like highlight of his mythological this mythological quality. Like we're going now, we're going back in time to witness like his origin, right? Like and so it's like it to me it feels like um, moving through this mythological journey, I guess, almost of his life. Yeah, absolutely, and that really is kind of how the Venn documentary unfolds, right? We kind of go into this life, and then we kind of move forward, and I mean, he'll say in a few minutes, we won't, we won't watch that, but, um, right, like, it's a very different place than it, than it is now, right, which gives it this sense of, that makes that 1924 feel like a very long time ago, even though, in fact, it's, you know, his life was not very long, longer certainly than many of the other people during um, activists during the period, but yeah, absolutely. Other things that people are thinking about or in relationship to that? Uh, is like within five minutes, we have a range of like, battling as a person, like you know, as a human being, we have the, between growing up for being sexuality, being part of this uh, world of people who are like smart and who are like in this small circle of people who have capacity to interpret things and you have family and you have all of these aspects of who he was and who he is today um, living ways and and one thing that I really like about Baldwin is As a black man, he is more than a black man when he talks about race and society, um, which is like that's how it is. And within five minutes, you can see all that. And now you go back to yes, now you have an hour and 20 minutes to go and get a little deeper and more of those aspects, which is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So you get that immediate, and I like also just kind of noting the ways in which one of the things the film immediately does is mentions Baldwin's sexuality, right? And, and not only mentions Baldwin's sexuality, but shows Baldwin talking about his sexuality. So instead of this conception that Baldwin ne only spoke about race, never spoke about sexuality, we see him doing so very early on. And yeah, we have these people, not only like the intellectual um, luminaries of the period thinking about, and the kind of generation after with Andalou and Baraka, um, to show not, not only his, not only the kind of reception that he has, but his continued relevance, right? Both, both to writer, black writers of the period, and also non-black writers, right? There were other people who spoke at that, and we see within the film also um, non-black writers like Styron, who he also, um, you know, he defended Styron's um, Nat, you know, what was it, Confessions of Nat Turner as well. So yeah, and we get a lot of that exactly in that really brief moment before we then kind of get in and, and see, you know, it shows us the visual of the, the years and then we kind of go into, you know, this moment where we're going back. So it's a sense of humor too, when somebody does question. Yeah. Like <laughs> right, exactly. So we get a sense and that again humanizes yeah. him as a figure, right? So we get, um, not only that kind of the human dimension that Baldwin is so often interested in in, in his essays, right, and thinking about the figure of the human not placed within all of these categories, but then also kind of humor about what that actually has meant for his life. Yeah.
Yeah, sorry. I was going to say, the thing that stuck out to me was in kind of the introduction of the while he's speaking, again, parts of his identity is talking about like his uh, renunciation of Christianity sexuality, and then we cut for it was this very good one, it was like a um, and then we cut to the funeral, which is both, just immediately starts out with religious imagery, and then kind of slowly incorporates some other aspects, like having the drums there as well, but just like starting off with saying like, oh, he wasn't Christian, he was usually by four, and then at this big, somewhat religious funeral, I feel like creates an interesting area. Yeah, and I think that also kind of speaks to the complexity that the filmmakers are trying to kind of offer there instead of, um, you know, what, what um, Consuela Francis describes as kind of a denunciation of you know, religion in general. Yeah. What do people think of the opening, the th- I think it was three clips of Baldwin's interspliced, right? And could you tell when they were from, right? Or did it, how much did you register his shifting age um, across those? I think I was, (laughs) maybe I shouldn't say this quote, one of my mentors, it was just about the kind of difficulty sometimes of telling the age of black people. But um, I think sometimes with Baldwin you can tell by the increasing um, depth of the kind of furrow of his in his forehead. But they all come from very different moments, it seems like, like at different ages. What does that tell us, or why do you think that that might have been a deliberate choice right, to offer us these three, um, yeah, to offer very different moments in those images, or did that, yeah. I feel like it might be kind of showing that he isn't this monolith in a way, like his opinion in each one is different, and there is some continuity, but there's also like, there's a distinctiveness to like each period as well. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think that both speaks to the complexity of depicting a life and so many texts. Um, And also I think the desire in that juxtaposition um, on Thorson's part to offer some consistency in terms of thinking of kind of Baldwin's thinking across them, right? That that it's possible to, and I think that this is a potentially controversial statement about anyone, uh, that their kind of thoughts are fairly consistent across. Um, And even as they kind of inflect differently with different speakers or Etc. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the next clip here, which really speaks to how I think the documentary is constructing Baldwin as an author, right? So one of the things that um, that Francis describes in terms of his Baldwin's relevance was that his writings were kind of important at a particular moment, that he was never a particularly good artist. And again, these are, I'm just kind of offering what the 80s, what would have been the kind of 80s consensus so we can think through both where we are now in terms of how we understand Baldwin and also potentially the way the film kind of intercedes in that. At Chalet in in the snow, um, I listened to Bessie Smith and to Vats Waller and they carried me back to what I myself had been like when I was a little boy and gave me the key to the language which gave me go to out on the mountain. Because of the sound of the typewriter, I remember when he finished the novel because he typed, you know, the end, you know, bing, bing, very slowly with hitting, you know, very strongly. Then I think I came out of the kitchen. I said, Ah, bien, mon vieux, je crois que c'est fini. And he said, Yes, it's the end. So we got out. We had a lot, a lot of drinks, okay? We got drunk, and that was it. When then we down, we came down to the valley, put that the novel on the mail, and it was uh, published, obviously. Yeah. Well, in 1948, I was the publicity director of Knopf, Alfred Knopf, the publisher. And uh, sounds grand, but it's $75 a week then, however. And I read a lot of magazines in the, in the course of doing publicity. And I read these marvelous pieces by uh, James Baldwin in first in Commentary magazine, a piece about Harlem. 
and then a few pieces in the New Leader, which is sort of a Trotskyite, I guess, magazine of the time, still going. And they were so wonderful, these pieces, that I went to the editor-in-chief named Harold Strauss. And I said, Harold, look at this. This is a wonderful writer. He's, he's concise, he's powerful, he's witty, and he's saying something. And uh, you should get after it. I wasn't doing any editing then. Uh, and Harold said, oh, thank you. And he read the pieces. He said they were very nice. He liked them very much. And he knew the woman who was uh, Jimmy's agent then, who was also named Strauss, Helen Strauss, no relation whatsoever. And uh, Helen said, yes, this is a, Jimmy's working on a novel, and I'll send it over to you. And uh, eventually, Harold got this bale of uh, manuscript in all different sized pages and uh, uh, different typewriters obviously used on it over the course of the years. And he looked, he read some of it, and he called me and he said, I don't like this kind of book, Bill. It's, I don't, it's not a real straightforward narrative novel, you know. Would you look at it? And so I took it home, and here, this very apartment. And I read it, and I thought, my God, this is a big book. This is important. And I took it in, back to the office. And two other editors read it and agreed with me, said it was a wonderful book. And we did it. Yeah, I think this is an autobiographical novel. You know, he wrote these confessionals. He wrote a lot of autobiographical work explaining what it is to grow up in Harlem. I want to give an example of this. Excellent scene here with, and notice the detail and the economy of this passage, okay? And this is uh, Sunday morning in church. Okay, now get this. The sisters in white heads raised, the brothers in blue, heads back. The white caps of the women seeming to glow in the charged air like crowns. The kinky gleaming heads of men seeming to be lifted up. And the rustling and the whispering ceased and the children were quiet. Perhaps someone coughed or the sound of a car horn or a curse from the streets came in. Then Elijah hit the keys beginning at once to sing and everybody joined him. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me on. Baldwin's idea was that uh, Christianity could expand and include more people, even whites. You notice in Go Tell on the Mountain, uh, the father believes that whites are irredeemable. <laughs> And the white man start giving us prizes. I'm about to ask myself, what it is they after? The white man's been our torment for over a hundred years. Anything he do, everything he tries is a way of beating us down, keeping us small. You don't believe me, do you? How can I put this? The Baptist church for example, in which I grew up. In all but actual fact, you know, in all but actual vocabulary, assumed that the saved were black and all the doomed were white. It was a kind of um, fantasy revenge. And it was also, very importantly, a way of getting them from one day to another through their lives as it turns out, through generations. But, you know, times do change. Well, I was very excited about it, and I was pushing it in all directions, but uh, it didn't get great reviews. Nice reviews, they were okay, but not fantastic. The Times was disappointing, as I remember. That's the most important place to have a review, and uh, hardly a dog barked, as they say in England, when the book came out. But it was, uh, and it sold reasonably well, but of course later on it went on to sell millions in, in various paperback editions and be adopted at uh, school courses and so on. But Jimmy, little Jimmy then didn't know that. I hear Baldwin as a part of the continuity, begun, if you will, for me anyway, with Frederick Douglass in 1849 and the slave narrative. I hear his voice. I hear Baldwin when I think of Jupiter Hammond, a slave in the, in the 18th century. I hear Baldwin in the music, the lyric, really, of George Moses Horton, a black slave writing about 1840, 50. He wrote, alas, and was I born for this, to wear this slavish chain. I hear Baldwin. 
After Go Tell in the Mountain was published, he wrote me in 19, it would be 19, January 54, that he, he has a project and said, it's a great departure for me and it makes me rather nervous. It's not about Negroes, first of all. It's locale as the American colony in Paris. What is really delicate about it is that since I want to convey something about the kinds of American loneliness, uh, I must use the most ordinary type of American I can find. The good white Protestant is the image I want to use. This is precisely the kind of American about whose setting I know the least. Whether this will be enough to create a real human being, only time will tell. It's a love story, short, and wouldn't you know it, tragic. Our American boy comes to Europe, finds something, loses it, and in his acceptance of his loss, becomes, to my mind, heroic. It's called Deep Secret, One for My Baby. Well, it wasn't called One for My Baby. It was called Giovanni's Room, eventually. And uh, he finished it and sent it to his agent, who gave it to Knopf. And wouldn't you know, I was on vacation when it came in, when the manuscript came in, and the two editors who had worked on Go Tell It read it, and I guess they were scared. They were scared about this. It was a homose homosexuality was the theme, and that was not on the books in those days. There's very little written about homosexuality, certain very few novels. And they turned it down. And when I got back from vacation, I was horrified, but it was gone by that time. It had gone back to the agent who was peddling it to somebody else. Jimmy Baldwin was neither in the closet about his homosexuality, nor was he uh, uh, running around proclaiming, you know, uh, uh, homosexuality. I mean, he was what he was, and you either had to buy that or, you know, me a call, but go somewhere else. I think the trick is to say yes to life. I think that the tales, it's only, you know, only it's we at 20th century, which is so obsessed with the particular details of anybody's sex life. I don't think those details make any difference. And I will never be able to deny a certain power that I have had to to deal with, which is dealt with me, which is, which is called love. And love comes in very strange packages. I loved a few men, I loved a few women. And a few people have loved me, and that's, I suppose, that's all that saved my life. So there was a lot there, but it takes us through, for the most part, Baldwin's first two novels. And so I wonder, what do people kind of think about the way that the documentary depicts his fiction? Right? So we start with the, um, you know, when his writing of it and the connection between, and really a depiction through his autobiography at the time of the writing, um, and then move to a discussion of the kind of really autobiographical nature of that, of that novel. And we see Ishmael Reed, um, Amiri Baraka, and Dr. Maya Angelou. So we have kind of the three primary figures of African-American literature that are mobilized within, um, within this documentary. So I wonder what people kind of thought about the way, so this as a direct, as a kind of attempt at a direct cinema um, documentary, at least in the sense of not having a voiceover narration can t only really tell the story through its juxtaposition of these voices. So yeah, I'm just wondering how people encountered that, especially kind of uh, in, re in relationship to how it tries to tell us about Baldwin's fiction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think what you just said was uh, like a really brilliant way to uh, Point across because all the act, all the different people are telling us. You know, I'm speaking uh, to the camera, of course, about the genius of the genius of his work from different angles. And uh, you have this movie in there for with Bernard and uh, uh, um, you know they, they have it, and um, they have it. Each has a unique point of view, but. But they're all pretty consistent relative to the quality and importance of his work. Right, absolutely. Right, and that focus on style, right, where Reed kind of spends a moment really saying, listen to the economy of the phrasing, listen to, um, and even the editor who kind of says, I found Baldwin this way and I thought his writing was, and so, which is, which is really kind of perhaps both necessary in this kind of documentary, but also kind of really different from how Baldwin was being read at the time, which was 
as not any of those things, especially not in terms of his fiction. Right? And it also kind of tells us how many people have read a novel by James Baldwin? How many of you have read Giovanni's Room? I, my sense is that Giovanni's Room is the novel right now. Maybe Beale Street, you know, and I was reading some work from the person who wrote Notes of a Native Son, and they talked about, they had some data from about Seattle, uh, the Seattle Public Library, and one of the things they noted that was that post uh, the Barry Jenkins film that the, um, the checkouts of Beale Street had skyrocketed, but that most consistently it was the fire next time in any net. But I think that in terms of the people that I know who, in, who teach Baldwin, it's Giovanni's room that seems to be the kind of most, um, the text that they choose a lot. Part of that, of course, is Giovanni's room and Beale Street are the shortest novels <laughs> by a long, by a lot. So if you're gonna teach something, those are kind of the two that you would choose. But I think, you know, also Giovanni's room is um, both short and you know, really captures, I think, also the contemporary importance of Baldwin as a black queer figure. Uh, other thoughts about how this film chooses to juxtapose these voices or things that you found interesting about the way that it kind of thinks through, yeah, Baldwin's novels here. Yeah. Um, I, I was really struck by what um, Maya Angelou said about um, Baldwin's, like, uh, noticing or recognizing Baldwin's voice in Giovanni's room. Um, and I think Absolutely, and it's a kind of crucial element, I think, in the construction of Baldwin in this film, right? Because in part, it's also, and Baraka takes this up at another point in the film, is to think about Baldwin in a black literary tradition, right? So not just to think about him and not to, as was often narrated, especially as from Giovanni's room into another country and thinking about the representation of black queer men and then the kind of refusal of that as um, something that belonged properly to African American literature, right? So there's this, um, you know, when she does that, she really is allowing the film to both say Baldwin never hid his sexuality and to say that that doesn't exclude him from um, being part of the black literary canon. Anything else that people were kind of thinking about or moments that they kind of wanted to draw our attention to? Yeah. I think the way that the interviews are curated in this film is really interesting because there tends to be a pattern where it's like two or three interviews with um, literary contemporaries and then an interview with Baldwin himself. Mm -hmm. And I think that the place where I noticed that the most was when he was discussing his own ideas around queerness because like, in the ways that I hear the narrative of queerness and the way that he's talking, it really does feel like a modern concept of queerness. It's not the narratives that were happening necessarily at the time. It does feel like very nuanced and modern in that way. So it'd be interesting to hear other people's ideas of his queerness and then his own ideas and experience of his queerness in, in juxtaposition of one another. Yeah, I think absolutely that's so true. I think. Well, I think Baldwin's conception of his sexuality and his queerness is very connected to his conception of masculinity, which, which places it at a kind of interesting both. I think absolutely you see these, this connection to contemporary queerness and also a kind of slight divergence from it in certain ways, um, which I think is absolutely a kind of fascinating thing to think about as, as he's narrating it. And, and then the ways in which Baldwin has taken up in our contemporary moment that sometimes is, and the extent to which when we see a quotation 
we kind of understand the complexity with which he was thinking that at a moment that, you know, as I, at a moment that is before queer theory, right? At a moment before um, and through like a lot of the you know, Stonewall and all of the kind of ways in which before pride and things like that. Great. Okay, so let's take a look at, I think maybe we should watch the last two together. Fine. I'm not the only case, I'm not the only, you ought to be the most spectacular. You have to find a way to do your work, because if you don't do your work, then you really are useless. You do spend a long time between novels, why is that? I'm that kind of writer, there's no answer to that. You know, everybody works the way he can work. I must point out, though, too, that I've been working in the last few years between assassinations. That doesn't make it any easier either. He was working on If Beale Street Could Talk. And he was, it was the first novel he had written since America. And that bothered him very much. It's a uh, book that stands out from the other books. It's a very bitter book. And I think that's because he'd been disillusioned by what happened in the 60s, by the assassination of Malcolm X, the assassination, assassination of Martin Luther King. It was a very desperate uh, period and sort of like a post, -re I would call it a post-revolutionary novel in which uh, all the injustices, re injustices remain uh, police brutality, uh, and uh, you almost feel as if the uh, characters in that book are stalked, like animals, like game. I had certainly seen him before that particular afternoon, but he'd been just another cop. After that afternoon, he had red hair and blue eyes. He was somewhere in his 30s. He walked the way John Wayne walks, striding out to clean up the universe. And he believed all that. Like his heroes, he was kind of pinheaded, heavy gutted, big assed, and his eyes were as blank as George Washington's eyes. But I was beginning to learn something about the blankness of those eyes. What I was learning was beginning to frighten me to death. If you look steadily into that unblinking blue, into that pinpoint at the center of the eye, you discover a bottomless cruelty, a viciousness cold and icy. In that eye, if you do not exist, you are lucky. Uh, people say Jimmy grew bitter. <laughs> Put it this way to you. You cannot go to a page and describe a human being in love or a human being's pain if you're bitter. Bitterness is like cancer. It eats upon the host. Jimmy was not bitter. What Jimmy was was angry. He was constantly. He was angry at injustice, at ignorance, at exploitation, at stupidity, at vulgarity. Yes, he was angry. What is it you wanted me to reconcile myself to? I was born here almost 60 years ago. I'm not going to live another 60 years. You always told me it takes time. It has taken my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and my sister's time, my nieces and my nephew's time. How much time do you want for your progress? Jimmy wouldn't let people off the hook, and uh, some people are bothered by that. And one way of handling the problem was to say, oh, his powers have slipped, you know. It's too bad that the public has to regard a writer of Jimmy's value and worth and contributions as somebody who was in and out of, out of vogue. I don't think somebody who fought for human rights and dignity the way Jimmy did should be uh, like last year's... Uh, bow tie or this year's straw hat. What people tend to forget is that Jimmy spent a large part of his later years teaching as well as writing. He lectured all over the country. He taught for several years. So I, I will confess that I've actually never seen If Beale Street Could Talk, the movie version. Um, but there seems to be, and I want to put this out there, and then we'll watch the kind of last few moments of the film, and then maybe we can come back to it. For those of you who have seen it, I think, does Ishmael Reed's description kind of concord to what you understand that film to be doing? 
Um, I guess because I, I took it to be a kind of, and is it a kind of love story? That's not exactly how, how I would necessarily imagine the, or I think of the book necessarily, but so it's an interesting way then if Ishmael Reed is kind of like, this is the post-revolutionary novel that is kind of an expression, he kind of gives in a little bit to the idea of, I think Baldwin, um, Baldwin being some bitter, which Angelou doesn't grant. Um, but I wonder then if in 2019, if we get a different, if we had a different take on that uh, with that film. Um, I did, my first year here, I did speak to a church group who had, here in Minneapolis who had chosen that as their all church read. Um, and that was an interesting moment to kind of think about why, why that novel at that moment. But I would love to hear thoughts on that as we, you know, when we move into the next phase. But if you wanna kind of take us to the very end, um, which is really just the kind of funeral moment and the final quotes, and then we'll move to Q&A. Everybody who came into contact with Jimmy had his or her life changed, I think. And that's the mark of a, of a real teacher. It's the mark of a real preacher. Um, and it's the mark of a prophet. And I think Jimmy was in many ways a prophet. He said, I pray I've done my work so that when I've gone from here and all the turmoil through the wreckage and rumble, and through whatever, when someone finds themselves digging through the ruins. He said, I pray that somewhere in that wreckage, they'll find me. It's somewhere in that wreckage that they can use something that I left behind. And if I've done that, then I've accomplished something in life. A day will come when you will trust you more than you do now. When you trust me more than you do now. We can trust each other. I do believe, I really do believe, in the New Jerusalem. I really do believe that we can all become better than we are. I know we can. But the price is enormous and people are not yet willing to pay it. So I just want to kind of conclude my talking about this with, with juxtaposing those last kind of two moments. One is really thinking about the wreckage and the other about the possibility of whether after that wreckage or before that wreckage of a new Jerusalem. And I think one of the things that is so compelling and complicating about, complicated about engaging and encountering James Baldwin at the moment is in thinking through the relationship between those two and where we are. Right, where we, there's so much more Baldwin, things like I'm Not Your Negro, which is, if we think through the kind of story that of Remember This House really takes up that text again, but obviously not in the way, and couldn't possibly in the way that Baldwin had imagined it, um, with Thorson, uh, with people or kind of Twitter handles like Son of Baldwin, um, If Beale Street Could Talk by Barry Jenkins, an exhibit like More Various, More Beautiful, and more terrible, and the upcoming biopic um, with Billy Porter. Right? We're at a moment of, and you know, Twitter slash X, um, you know, quotations abound. Um, and I think there's something really, or I'd be interested to hear about how we see the mobilization of Baldwin in and through this idea of ruin, or potentially. Um, the movement toward more trust in one another, 
to be the kind of optim to mobilize that optimistic view that we see in the end there. So yeah, I don't know. If, I hope people have thoughts about that. We are we all are in the wake of this film, and you know, in the moment we are on the second to last day of Black History Month, and um, you know where Baldwin is kind of most likely to you know, appear to us in his soundbite form. And so, yeah, I'm just hoping that we can think through a little, some of that, um, and scene. <laughs> I think there's a way to submit questions anonymously if you desire, but also you could just, we can just do what we've been doing if it, if people prefer. Um, In a way, you would basically prophetic in terms of what's happening now. I mean, it's basically the journey is towards achieving uh, justice for the LGBT in those communities. Or it still needs to be done and uh, executed. So even seeing what he was saying back then, I mean, he basically said it, you know, in terms of who he was. Hopefully that the future will be brighter. Right, absolutely. And it's and in the time between when that was said and when the film was made and where we are now, he's become much more a part a voice in the in in speaking for and speaking about some of those things that, you know, instead of just being someone who spoke a lot about race and didn't speak about his queerness, like we see um, the way he spoke about like so many things and speaks to so many things that are still um, still important. Yeah. Um, that was great. Thanks. Um, I was wondering to ask you a question, I guess, um, about kind of how you think the film is framing Baldwin as writer, specifically fiction, drama, writer, as opposed to just, I guess, writer, right? Because um, I think. I think that's exactly right. And I think it's partly that, for those of us who have read all of Baldwin, some of it is difficult to read, right? I, especially, and I don't think, I don't, in, to my recollection, there is no mention of just above my head outside of maybe just saying the title. And I think part of that is it's a very long novel and in some ways it, it to my mind, maybe could have used some editing, right? There are moments where you have a narrative, you have someone telling a story that they couldn't possibly have, like that it just doesn't make sense that they're the narrator, which I think in part is because Baldwin really seemed to lean into the first person narrative and in some places it might have, like a, a third person narrative might just have been um, necessary to tell some of the stories. But I think I think you're right that there's a certain, I think it, it does some re beginning recovery work on Giovanni's room, like that it, it, it spend some time with that. Um, it kind of hews pretty closely to Go Tell Them the Mountain as the good novel. Um, it doesn't say a ton about Tell Me How Long the Train Has Been Gone. Um, and again, and it actually spends, interestingly, quite a bit of time on, not the Amen Corner, but the other, I can't remember the other play at this moment, but 
Yes, so it spends a, both some time showing the, um, the stage production, but also kind of talking about that. And I think also, you know, interestingly, that's, that's not usually regarded as a particularly, um, as one of his better works, and yet it, it seems to try and do that, again, to push back maybe against the kind of narrative of his being bitter. But yeah, I think you're right. There's a certain level of ambivalence that doesn't, that moves pushes the needle a little bit away from, I think, the decline narrative. And, and I think there's a quote a little bit later that says, you know, s s novels are hit and miss, right? That every novelist has some good novels, has some bad novels. Um, and so kind of just refuses to put it into the kind of decline narrative and instead just kind of offers it as some are good and some are bad. And, you know, I think in addition, the decline narrative is super easy because almost everybody has one. <laughs> like most, most novelists who produced for any length of time, like their last novels are always the worst. Like any, you know, band, Cannon Crows, please have a good album soon. Oh God, I can't believe it's that out loud. Anyways, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I hope that kind of spoke to that. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to, for me to see like in the previous uh, clip that you about time, like from mm -hmm. Maya and Luz point of view, like you can see, you can feel this from the little last few and a half, this timeless reflector of, of Baldwin's work. And then you see Baldwin saying, you know, how much time do you need for me? Like you are going to like drop your frogs like this. Like you see the time and then probably you can see with your students, like what your students actually talking about it now when they see or they read or just, uh, listen to Baldwin speak. But that for me was like kind of like, yeah, you can see all of this work is expressed by that. Yes. And then you say like, if this is bitter, was it time? Is it angry? Like, but this asking a real question. Like. And that's a beautiful observation too, because on the one hand, Angelou and I think Baraka does it slightly differently, but like is making something kind of beautiful about the continuity and placing Baldwin into that continuity, but part of that continuity. And this is, you know, Baraka says, um, notes that it's both related to kind of African past, but also related to being a minoritized subject in the United States, right? Being oppressed makes a kind of political, like makes politics and literature kind of essentially essential. And so the so when Baldwin says, you know, how much time do you need, there's a way in which his art is also a product of and, and his relationship to the tradition is also a product of that that kind of continuing same. Um, yeah, which I've been thinking a lot about, um, which kind of makes me think about the relationship. I don't I don't think in general that Baldwin is kind of Afro -pes or pessimistic or an Afro pessimist, but there is kind of some ways in which some of those articulations around that continuing same kind of reminds us of some of the thesis of like the kind of continuing relationship between blackness and slavery, for instance. But that's a really beautiful observation, I think, to both think about the kind of way Angelou and Baraka describe that, but then at the same time, the, um, yeah, that how much time do you, how much time do you want? Yeah. I'm curious how you see, like, your role as an interpreter and scholar of Baldwin and other novelists, because, you know, you're not creating novels or writing novels, but you have this responsibility to, like, you know, deal with their work. That's an interesting question, I think, um, because I don't always think of it that way. Like, I, I think of myself as a scholar who's interested in novels and often and in trying to understand what they do, which usually means I'm not that interested in the lives of the novelist as much more than kind of one other dimension. Um, but that's very different from when I'm asked to speak publicly like this, um, or other times like 
by the end of this week, there will probably be five to six things with my name on it that have, you know, that are public and that James Baldwin <laughs> is attached to. And I, I don't consider myself a James Baldwin scholar. Um, and so it's really, in, the, in one sense, really humbling and trying to both be authentic to my own interest in what novels are doing um, and my own kind of, um, yeah, interest in just kind of saying that. And then the, there's a, one of the last quotes that we saw was about, um, you know, it's a shame that that we think about Baldwin as being in vogue or not in vogue. And while certainly the voguishness of any author isn't particularly interesting to me, there is a kind of different layer when the desire is celebration. And as important as that is, I don't know that I'm always the best person for it. So there's just an, I don't know that I answered the question, but it is complicated um, when you're asked to and you want to do things publicly, um, but that in some ways they might be not quite, not necessarily not in line with, but just different from how you in your kind of private moments might think and talk about and talk about anything. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time talking about Baldwin with um, various people in you know in different ways, and you know if you read, and I'm not. I'm not <laughs> shilling for you should read the essay that I wrote about Baldwin's um, Afro-pessimism in another country, but it's a very kind of different, like I would never, someone said, well, you could just read, I was like, you know, I <laughs> it would be absolutely unsatisfying for me to stand up here and to, <laughs> and to you know, offer you an academic reading of, of another country. So, so yeah, it's an interesting, and I'm, I'm actually trying to kind of think and write a little bit about um, what it means to be a sort of um, local expert on a topic. And please feel free to push me back. If there's, some, if there's something that I didn't answer there, or something that like that sparked, please feel free to ask it. Yeah, I guess the, this, this, this was an interesting answer, but I think it's the first day of this essay from like the 80s. I can't remember the name of the person, but she's talking about, she's like a literary, um, scholar and criticized her, like literary like criticism for being too philosophical and she's saying she has like a real responsibility to the novel and to the author to like both kind of protect their work and put it into the future but also to like engage with it on this like language level and so that's kind of where the question is coming from but from the perspective of, I think different authors also have very different conceptions of what the critic should do and what the relationship between the art, the work and the critic is and or should be. So I, I wouldn't presume that anything that I might have to say about anyone would be satisfying to them, whether it be kind of, let's think about the language of the novel and, you know, and or let's kind of think about the legacy of the person or any of those things. So, um, you know, I think oftentimes it's, I hope people consult their own ethics and then do what they can. <laughs> or at least that's where I'm at. <laughs> uh, other questions that people have or thoughts on anything we saw? If Beale Street could talk, should I watch it? Should I not watch it? I'm not gonna watch it, but. <laughs> <laughs> watching the documentary again and thinking about the publisher's comments in particular and the machinations of publishing from the 1980s to the 1990s to the early 2000s and how much there was a greater appetite for the novels like James Baldwin wrote. And I was mourning that he published when he did instead of 10 years later, 15 years later. And I'm wondering if that struck you as well in thinking about the context of those that pivotal moment the shift in publishing from the 1980s to the early 2000s and thinking about Baldwin as his novels out of time for a moment and like how did they play then? I think that's a great question and I think, I mean what you see and I think this is partly why 
Angelou is deployed here is the kind of black women's renaissance of the kind of 70s, 80s and after. Um, and so I do kind of wonder, and obviously that group of writers was very much inspired by Baldwin, even though I think when you think about Baldwin's representation of black women in his text and women in general in his text, it's a complicated, um, it's a complicated relationship. Um, but I, I do think it's in, it would be interesting to see in part because, because of just the dominance of black women at that moment. So I don't, I actually don't know, like certainly I think now or um, Baldwin writing probably <laughs> would be. <laughs> um, but then, you know, of course I think Baldwin wouldn't write those novels now, right? Um, and so you know, he, like all of us, would be a product of the kind of moment in which he grew up and the life that he lived. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it would be interesting to kind of think about what is the appetite for, like I think, um, what's the novel that, The Prophets, <laughs> I think, is that, is that the novel that came out recently? Um, and which I think was a bestseller, I, I bought a copy. Um, I did not read it yet, but <laughs> I bought a copy. Um, and, but at the same time, it kind of, what I think also returns to enslavement, which also kind of suggests, a, I think Baldwin's kind of, biggest engagement might be when Ida says, like, she would have, we'd have to go pretty far back in history where she would have been a queen. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's an interesting question. And I think it's a really complex one. Um, and I think all of the things come to bear, like shifting, you know, shifting interest in different particular identities, um, the, the world that Baldwin made what would it be if Baldwin hadn't made that world and then was publishing after? So yeah, I think it's a really fascinating thought experiment and I wish I had something more clever to say about it, but I like the question. <laughs> uh, other thoughts that people are kind of having or questions, moments either that we looked at or that you saw in the documentary if you'd watched it, other moments that were compelling? We don't talk much about his life and They do spend a, a good portion in the middle, I think, on on Baldwin's time in France, and we have you know his French lover, and so I think you do get like his. There's a kind of brief mention of the both his incisive thinking about the that, and I think Angelou begins by saying that that France doesn't have any kind of national guilt vis-a-vis -vis African Americans, but that it's kind of the miserables are the Algerians, and that Baldwin was really incisive in thinking about um, his relationship to Algerians, both in his own poverty, but also just as um, similarly positioned. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I'd have to, had I thought about organizing my thoughts in that way, I would be interested in thinking through. Because in some ways, the way that some of the film describes um, Baldwin's time is in France is that it is kind of clarifying for, his, for him understanding himself as an American, right? He says that I, um, you know, I took my home with me. If you don't take your home with you, then you're homeless. Um, so I'd be interested in kind of thinking about whether viewed from that angle, if we get a sense that, that in large part Paris is, or France is a, um, yeah, what its kind of placement within the film is and when it, within, it, within the film's understanding of Baldwin's life. Like is it a, you know, oftentimes he's going back to France and people describe him as being very angry or um, that it's kind of a respite and then it talks sometimes about his other world travels, so. Yeah, and he did kind of come back and forth and I think it was maybe in the late 50s post um, Brown versus the Board of Education where he goes to the South for the first time. I'm not sure how post that. Um, but, you know, he, he did come back 
and you know, he kind of talks about in a, something that we didn't watch that you know he was a, not able to be a private person in those moments. And I think you know part of it, and you know thinking through the the difficulty that he describes in writing the final um, or the his novels, um, kind of speak maybe to. Um, both the importance of sometimes being witnessed in the United States and thinking about, you know, in school um, desegregation and in, in the, at the March on Washington, but at the same time, maybe the difficulty in, in writing that he kind of saw as his, you know, as he said, you know, if you're, if you're a writer and you don't write, you're useless. And, you know, if you can't do that in, you know, he escaped the United States in the first place, he says, to be able to do some of that and not unlike a lot of other American writers. So one thing that also that reminded me of was the, so in The Price of the Ticket, the essay, he kind of talks about, it's one of the places and probably not the only one where he kind of talks about changing names, but in particular kind of the changing names of you know, how one becomes American and white, um, you know, at Ellis Island and thinking about the shift of, uh, you know, names with different ethnic identities that then kind of are, is both a way of becoming white and a way of not being black in a certain way. So just reminded me of that, I'm not sure it was. Yeah, any final questions? I think we're kind of moving toward very closely to the end of this. So if anyone has a kind of final question or thing that I can fumble my way toward an answer to, I would be happy to attempt it. <laughs> Well, if not, it really has been a pleasure to think with you, and I really do appreciate um, that I didn't have to do all of the work um, because that's, um, <laughs> there's nothing I dislike more than hearing myself talk and a thing that I already think I know the answer to, and I, I found that I didn't today. So thank you.